man. Romans 15. We have been coming through the book of Romans. As you're aware, we're, we're, we're coming to an end. However, you know, I, I get to certain passages and I don't get stuck, but I can't just go through that passage without giving that passage of scripture, or that verse of scripture. The Justin says, you know, and uh, we're in no hurry. Amen? And the only thing we're waiting for is the rapture of the church. So, so we may as well just slow our roll. Right? Go through the book and go and go. There will be times here at church that I will only focus on one word. And tomorrow, this morning is going to be one of those days. However, uh, we're going to cover two verses. Okay? And uh, these, these verses are very important uh, to our growth as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there are some practical things that Paul has given us in, in these last two chapters, or well, actually starting in chapter 14. Uh, and and the, the objective when Paul wrote this is that he had brought us through all of the doctrinal things that we needed to understand in the book of Romans uh, in chapters 1 through uh, 13. But when we get to chapter 14, he then gives us some practical things that actually deal with this. And, and, and hear me. This is, this is his objective, I believe, in these final chapters. How can you, as a believer, become Christ-like? How do you take the scriptures and understand how to become Christ-like? And, and, and it's like anything else. How we treat each other has to start at home. Right? How, if we're going to pour out our life to, to others, we have to first, those of us are in, who are in the household of faith, we should love each other, we should care for each other, we should be Christ-like towards each other first before we can demonstrate that to a lost world. It would be a tragedy for me to treat a female in this church better than I treat my wife. Amen. My wife lives with me every day. My wife is, is, is the person that God has given me to Amen. be my help me, and we live together. I should not treat your wife or your sister or your, you know, uh, female in this church better than I treat my own because I have to demonstrate how to love someone within my own house first. Amen. Mm -hmm. And then I can come outside and demonstrate that to other people. Well, it's no different than us. We here in the household of faith need to learn how to love each other, care for each other, treat each other, so that then we can demonstrate, as people observe our lives, and how we treat each other, what it means to be a Christian. Amen. Amen. And that is what Paul's objective is in these final few chapters. Here's the reality, right? Christ, God has a plan for you. He has a plan for every individual. He, he, he first of all, his, his goal for each of you and you, I talk about this all the time, is for you first to get saved. When you, the day that you were, the day that your, your father's sperm fertilized your mother's egg, God began a plan. And that plan was for you to get saved. Then his plan for you, right, that's called the will of God. It's the same, it says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? So God is willing that all of us can say, but then, specifically to you, which is why he gave you your own thumbprint, your own toenail, your own the hairs in your head. You are a unique individual, only unique to you. There's no one else on this earth like you. No one else at all. We are all a little snowflake. You missed that. <laughs> Each of us are very individual and very unique. And God gave you that uniqueness. Your personality. He, you were born in the home that you were born with. The parents that you were born with. On the block that you were born. With the neighbors that you were born with. You attended the school that God. All of those were part of God's overall plan. But once you got saved, then his, he, his job, once you got saved, was to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. To make you Christ-like. And, and, and then you use that Christ-likeness in your unique way to perform what God intends for you to perform so that others can become 
uh, members of this family, members of this household of faith, the scripture calls us, right? So that we all can then serve him and serve others and serve the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what he intended. But in his plan for us, it's centered in us being used of God to fulfill the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Christ came in, in a three and a half year period, which was his early ministry. He lived for 33 years, right? But in three years, he invested in 12 men who then gave us a, a, a decent portion of the New Testament, at least in his writings, that we study. And those men have taken and, and, and poured out what we study today so that we can understand the life of Christ and what it means to then be believers. But God wants to use us specifically, and I believe this wholeheartedly, to reconcile lost people back to Christ. You know, we talk about this all the time. We're in the final, well, I don't believe we're in the final days. I don't. I do not believe that we're in the last days. I believe that we're in the last days. Amen. 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 Yeah, I believe we've gone past the last day. We are in the final moments of history as we know it. And we can see it changing very quickly. And I think that we have one last ditch effort. First of all, to live for him, and secondly, to reach people for Christ. Amen. This is it. Amen. I believe that we're the final period of church history. I told the people who were here on Wednesday, I said, I believe wholeheartedly because the scripture teaches that many of us will never die. Now, you, you grandma and great grandma and mommy and dad, people will die in your family. The, the scripture teaches that there is a percentage of us that will never see death. Amen. Because we'll get raptured out before we ever die. I believe that we are in those seconds. Many of us will not see death. I wholeheartedly have every reason to believe that to be true. So you know what God is intending for us to do? How much can you leave on the field? You know, leave it, leave it all out. Pour it all out. Now's the time. Now's the time to leave it all out there. Now's the time for you to get everything that you have. Because you're going to stand accountable to him for how you lived your life. Amen. What did you do to the glory of God? Or did you do it to your glory? Or were you more, more consumed about circumstances and situations in life that the enemy brought about to throw you off so that you were so caught up in what was going on in your circumstances and situation that you had absolutely no time to give to the Lord? Amen. That would be a tragedy to stand before him knowing that you were given a 24-hour period of time to live for I think that we should wake every morning with that on our heart. Yes. So that we can live for him. Amen. And then teach others for him. Reconcile other people back for him. So what God did was this. He has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. He wants to reconcile people back to him. So what he did was he chose an organism. That organism is called the local church where you could come here and you could be trained and you could hear teaching and preaching and you could go through a process to grow and mature as a believer so that you are more equipped to impact the world. That is our job as a church, is to, is to equip you and then provide even greater resources because you have natural resources through your family, your job, and different situations. But then we start ministry opportunities to then give you additional opportunities to reach the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I believe wholeheartedly that that is his plan. But it is the purpose that we as a church have established these opportunities to help you reach the lost world. So in Romans chapter 15, what we have been given in this chapter are seven concepts that will help us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to assist Christ in his ministry to reach the lost world for the Lord Jesus Christ. It says this in Romans chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. He says this, and we looked at this, so I'm going to cover it for your sake. He says, we then that are strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. He says,
says, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. So the first thing we see in verse 1 is this. He says that we're to bear the infirmities of weaker, immature Christians. That's the first concept in Romans chapter 15 that he wants us to understand. We are here to bear the, because we have to take care of the internal before we can do the external, right? We have to take care of each other first. And we're to bear each other's <laughs> infirmities. In other words, what we're called to do is to accommodate others by uh, not giving them our opinion, but God's opinion. And, and look out for the interest of our brothers and sisters. And in the context when he talks about weaker brothers, he's talking about immature Christians. We've talked about this in detail. There are members here, and some of you have, are very newly saved. Some of you were saved this year. You know, and, and, and some of those who have been saved for a longer period of time, you know what we're to do with our younger Christians? We're to bear their economy. We're to look out for their interests. Where the, we, we are to, to help them, to assist them, to, to, shed, to set the right example for them of what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. That's what we should do. Then he gives us the second part, uh, point, which is in verse 2 also. He says this, that we're to please one another to, to, to the other person's good, not to our own. In other words, uh, it'd be easy for me to please Ray and to only look out for Ray and to care about Ray. I have a wife, I have children that believe me, that I can spend enough time just making sure that within my own household I am pleased. But you know what God has done? He's called us to a much higher calling. And that higher calling is to please others. The scripture says that we should please others better than ourselves. Right? So we need to be pleasing each other. And that doesn't mean that we put up with each other. That doesn't mean that, you know, we don't want to be people pleasers. Right? But what we want to do is look out for the interest of other people. That means sometimes that you give up some of your time, you give up some of your talent. That means that you give up some of the resources that you have. Because those are things that will please other people to help other people because our job, once we get saved, is to lift each other up, is to pick each other up. And you know what? There are times in this life, as believers, that we need somebody to please, to, 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 to be a part of our life, to kind of look out for us. Because none of us are spiritual 24-7. Right? Amen. None of us are. None of us walk this, this life, and every day we're just a walking little Bible, and we're just so, you know, none of us. All of us go through infirmities. All of us go through issues. And you know what, what this, this verse is telling us to do? Lift each other up. Please each other. Right? And it goes on, and here's the third point. He said that we're to do this to the edification of others. That, the word edify means to lift up. We're to edify one another, right? We need to lift each other up. You know why? Because sometimes we're down. Have you ever just been down? You know, you wake up, you're down. You're feeling down. Something happened maybe, a circumstance, a situation. Something happened that you're just a little bit down. You know, and there's nothing better than another brother or sister calling you and saying, you know what? God's got it. You know, God's in it. You know, don't, don't give up. Don't give in. Just hang in there. You know, God's got you picked up. You know, I know that it seems bad right now. I know that things seem, seem a little heavy on you right now. But here I am. Can, maybe I can come take your kids to you for a day. Maybe we can go get a pedicure, a mani and a petty. Right? Yeah. Just hang out with each other, and I can lift you up. Maybe, you know, can, it's, it's when one of our members goes down sick, and other people go, and, and what they do is they provide a meal for them. Or they just call them and say, I, I just want you to know I love you. You know, it's that type of thing of lifting each other up because we're down and we're struggling. That's what we're to do with one another. But then he talks about something that we looked at uh, last week. He says this. He says that the fourth one that we're to do 
is that it is found in verse uh, chapter 15, verse 7. He says, Wherefore receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So the, 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 the fourth thing that we're to do is to receive one another as Christ received us. And you know, we looked at this last week. And, and, and I tried to remind you of, of something. None of us walked into this relationship all good. <laughs> Many of us walked into this relationship limping, hurt, needing the Lord. You know, often it's easier to reach a person uh, when they're down. It's easy to go and minister to them when they're struggling through something, right? Here's what this verse is saying. It was when you were at your worst that Christ received you. You know what we're not to do? Kick each other when we're down. Yeah. We don't need to look at people and say, you know what? You're a man. You're a complete disaster. You know what? God received us when we were at our worst. And you know what we're to do to each other? Receive each other when we're at our worst. Yeah. Hear me. This is internal, but it does it works for the external too. We're to receive each other because none of us walked in this thing all glory and good. But by the grace of God, you've been coming a little while and hopefully you're a little bit cleaned up. Right? But I, uh, some of you, I remember very well how dirty you were with me. Even when you thought you were clean. And you know what? All too often, we try to receive people. We want, if some young lady walks through that back door, and let's say she, she came from a homeless environment. She wasn't clean. Physically. Let's say some guy walked in here. He smelled. Physically. How would we receive them? Would we would, would, would you let them just sit next to you? Let's say they smell, hear me now, this is real. Let's say they smell like urine. <coughs> mm -hmm. And you just didn't even know that maybe they had a sickness. Mm -hmm. Where they had to you, wear a diaper even. You know that could be you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Right? Amen. And you know what, what, what this verse says that we're to do? Receive them. Because that's how Christ received you when you were pissing and smelling. Amen. Who are we to look down at someone because of some circumstance that they have that we don't receive them? Amen. The only time that we do that, and I said this last week, is when you forgot how you came through the door. You forgot that you are in need of salvation. So he says that we're to receive one another. We should understand some important things as believers, this. And, and we talked about this over the last week. Both Jew and Gentile have, who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. One day, all of us are going to reap the benefits of this relationship that we have with the Lord. When we stand before the Lord in the millennial kingdom, at the millennial reign of Christ, Paul says this in Romans chapter 15, verse 12. He says, and again, as I say, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and in him shall the Gentiles trust. That is the Lord Jesus Christ, the root of Jesse, coming through the line of David, who is one day going to rule and reign not only over the Jew that was promised, but he's going to reign over, over the Gentile as well. And in the millennial kingdom, he is going to sit on the throne in the literal physical city of Jerusalem and reign, and we will be then, will be, it will be the only time in history that there will be a government that will be a perfect government. <laughs> you know, we've been duped into believing and we become passionate about it, whether or not our candidate, whether it be Democrat or Republican, will be the one who will best serve us. Let me tell you something. 
None of them will serve you right. Amen. They're all in it for themselves. Amen. But the day is coming that there will be a king on the throne who will rule a perfect government Amen. that we will be underneath and that is the only hope that we have. So do yourself a favor. Well, Get off CNN. <laughs> Don't be upset with Trump. Don't be upset with Hillary. Don't think that either one of them have the answer because the only answer that we can look for is the king seated on the throne Amen. in the city of Jerusalem who will rule and reign over the world. Amen. And you know what? We need to spend our time trying to make sure that that hope is the hope that people have. Amen. All right? That's the only hope that any of us have. So now we're going to continue in our study. The first point that we're going to look at this morning is this. We're going to look at point one, and it has to do with how Christ's ministry is then preserved in us. Okay, we're to have a ministry. That ministry has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with anything but how we can be a part of the ministry of Christ to reconcile lost people back to him so that we can demonstrate to one another how we're to love each other, how we're to care for each other. We first do it there, then we can demonstrate it to the outside world. Okay? So that whole. So it starts and it says this in Romans, if you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Look at what he says here. He says, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We have hope. We can abound in that hope. But that hope only comes through the power of the Holy Ghost. We're to love each other. We're to care for each other. We're to receive each other. Right? We're to, we're, we're to have this relationship with one another. We, we are to bear one another's burdens. But there's only one way for you to genuinely do it. So that you're not doing it as a people pleaser or doing it in the flesh. And that is in the hope that comes only through the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. We talk about this often. What God uses me or anyone who stands in this pulpit, or you for that matter, when you're teaching someone, when you're teaching youth, when you're teaching at work, when you're sharing with someone, what God does is use you, and you should use this book as your God. You know, it's easier to stay in the book, that way you don't go outside of the, the, the context so that you're, you're now giving your own opinion. This is a safe way to do it. But you have to know that God only uses you to guide people through the scriptures. It is the person of the Holy Spirit of God that is the teacher. Amen. Yes. Right? I don't teach you anything. Yes. I haven't taught one person here one thing. You know why God does that? To remove me from getting all puffed up and thinking that I'm yes. some, you know, I didn't preach this bad sermon today. Well, you should have heard my sermon today. I tore him up. I tore him up. No. Because the glory goes to God, the glory goes to him, not me, right? Because this way it keeps me grounded so that I'm giving the Holy Spirit of God the credit, for lack of a better term, of the glory as it would be, so that I don't be glorified. Because you know what our problem is? We love glory. <coughs> Everyone, every now and then, wants a pat on the back. And I'm not saying that that's all bad. But when it comes to the things of God, you better remove yourself from it. Give God the glory so that he is glorified in you and not because you did some great thing. So he says that there is a hope that we're to have. There is a hope and there is a joy and there is a peace, he says, in believing that we could abound in this hope. Here's the thing. He wants us to grow in this hope that we can have. Right? As long as we understand that this, the last part of the verse, that it comes through the power of the Holy Ghost. That's all he said in verse, in verse 13. 
Look at then the fifth thing. I gave you four things. Let me give you the fifth one. It's found in verse 14. And he says this. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and we're going to focus on this right now, able also to admonish one another. This morning we're going to focus on admonishing one another. How do we admonish one another? When Paul uses this word, it means that we're to put in mind something by implication, watch this, to caution or reprove someone gently. Now, I grew up in a hard home. My mother had no problem saying it to you in a hard way. I have to be careful to admonish people not in the manner that I grew up being admonished. Mm -hmm. Did I make sense there? Oh, yeah. Sometimes we can admonish people, caution them, warn them, preach to them in a very hard way. Most people don't respond to that. There need, it need, there, we need admonishment. We need to be admonished. It just needs to be done sometimes in a gentle way. What we're to do is to admonish people. And in admonishing them, this is what it means. I want you to keep this in mind as we go through this word admonishment. Admonishing someone is what you do when you give them biblical advice or counsel by instructing them in the Word of God as to what their duties as a Christian are. It's what I do from the pulpit. It's what many of you do with other people. How do you counsel someone? How do you instruct someone biblically, staying in the context of the Scripture, with an objective? Your objective is, is that they move. You know, I, I, I've said this. The proof of our ministry is you. The proof of this church is, 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 is you. I wish I could go to work with many of you and see how much this ministry is working in your life. I'd like to go in some of your homes and see how you talk to each other. Because that is the proof of whether or not this thing is working. Right? Because there should be a change in your life, right? You came in through the doors. We received you as you were. We then started investing in your life through the process first of discipleship and other <laughs> things. But the objective is that eventually that started working in your life to change you. So that you started to treat one another. You know, it ought to, the word of God ought to make you think first before you act. Right. Right? Because you have, you let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So now, instead of you reacting in the old way that you reacted, you start reacting with the new mind that you have. You, 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 it's starting to change. That change doesn't happen overnight, and it's different for every person. Right? Some people, it takes a little longer. That's why we're to bear the infirmities of the weaker ones, the ones who don't get it as quickly. Right? So, but, but, but there ought to be a change. You know, and, and, and it's a tragedy because I go through my head, and, and I'm not trying to judge you, but I look at every person in this church, and I see how they react, and I process whether or not I'm seeing a change. You know, or, or is there a difference in their life? You know? And, 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 and so what I do is that I try to create that change through admonishing you, through preaching to you through counseling you, through giving you this book for the purpose of seeing your life become more Christ-like. That's the objective all along. The Greek word translated admonish is 
nopeo. And it means to counsel, advise, steer, or move. I am to counsel, advise, steer you. Because I'm trying, I'm trying to steer you. I really am. I talked, I said this last week. We're trying to, hear me, in a positive way, wash your brain of all of the stuff that you may have brought in. And sometimes we bring in a lot. I talked to a young, I had to officiate four basketball games yesterday. My hips are letting me know it as I stand here. <laughs> and I was, was, was talking to this young lady, and she clearly uh, was officiating with me. She was the other official. And she clearly uh, was, was a lesbian, okay? And, and I have found that there is a common theme that happens with many lesbians, I'm not saying all, but many lesbian women who uh, have been abused sexually. They have been abused sexually by men. Now, the family members oftentimes, oftentimes those aren't just strangers, right? It's a cousin, an uncle, a brother, a very you know, family member. And you know what? She was in need of admonishment. She was in need of being steered to know that God loves her because you think God doesn't love you if you can't protect me from my brother or my father who sexually abused me. See, those are the realities of why we need to have a new mind because you know what? We're dealing in a world that we're dealing with a fallen world of hurt people. There's people out here that are in need of you being what God called you to be because you work by them and they need some hope. Amen. They have no hope. They've been abused. When you get abused by the very person who's supposed to raise you, who's supposed to be your protector, they need someone to say, you know what? God, God loves you, and he still loves you. And here's the thing. God has a plan for them, too. And it was difficult for her. You know, and, and, and her, her, her sexuality had become her protection. She said, I'd rather be a man and protect myself from men because I've been abused by them. Do you realize that you're working with people and you're around people all the time? And you know what they need for you to do? Counsel them. They need for you to admonish them, to steer them in the direction because they have run from God. And we need to be pointing the people back to God where their real hope is. You know, the only way you can do that, though, is if you believe that God is your hope. Hmm. Yes. If you don't believe that God is your hope, you'll never talk to someone Amen. who's in need of hope. Amen. Unless you know that that's where your hope is. Amen. Amen. That's what we're called to do in counsel. Look at what Paul said when he wrote this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Hey, and if you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 3. And he said this. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. This is what you and I, this is one of the methods in Colossians 3, 16, where you and I can learn to, to, to deal with people. He says this. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. Now hear me. You've been, we're getting ready to go into the book of, of Proverbs. Proverbs represents, represents one of five wisdom books. When I start teaching out of Proverbs, do you know what, I, what the objective is? Is to, to take the principles of Proverbs, which represents, who can tell me what, what Proverbs is? I just, I just, I've been laying it out. I've been preparing your heart for it. What to say it again? The mind of God. You know what God wants us to have? It's his mind. He gave it to us in the five wisdom books so you can take the principles out of those wisdom books and let that mind be in you. So now I can admonish someone, I can counsel someone, not from my experiences, but from the mind of Christ. That, that's how you become an excellent counselor. Don't depend upon, lean not into your own understanding. Amen? So look what he says. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's how you to do it. Teaching and admonishing one another. How? He says, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, 
singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Amen. Do you realize that that, that's why it's important for you to be here for the worship service? Mm -hmm. Amen. So that you can admonish and teach through songs and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. That's what the purpose is. It's no different than a, than a mother. You know how a mother sometimes comforts her children? She'll sing to them. She'll sing a little, what we call a lullaby. Right? She'll sing a lullaby to her children. And you know what she's doing in trying to do that? She's trying to comfort them. By admonishing them through this process. Which is one of the ways that you can do it. But you know what we're going to do as well? When you and I read... What we're doing is admonishing one another through our study. We are, and, and what we're doing is that we do it to, to encourage, to counsel, to guide, to steer, and to direct people in God's sphere of influence. Because we want to influence people with the word of God. The verse isn't saying that we're to be professional psychologists. And sometimes we think that we are. Counseling is easy. And the day will come that we as a church will have a counseling ministry. I am praying that I'm able to take couples when we bring people in and Dawn and I don't do all the counseling. But there should be couples here who have demonstrated through their own marriage that they know how to get along so that they can, I'm not asking you to give your, your all, all your examples. You can take the principles of the Word of God as it d d relates to marriage and then counsel other people to strengthen their marriage. God doesn't require for you to have, a, have it all together. Even though you need to be a true demonstration that it works. Right? I can't have you walking, coming out of the parking lot, cussing each other out, going in the back room to counsel a couple. Right? But there are single women, hear me, this is the God of you. Even if you've had a mistake in a circumstance where you've not done everything right, what God does is take that and use it to his glory. He uses the mistakes that we've made in life because we learn through those processes so that we can help someone else not to make the same mistake. You can't look at it and say, well, I just made all these mistakes in my life. God can't use no, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't shortchange God. He allowed the mistake. Right? So that he can use that thing that you can admonish other people to bring them up, to lift them up, to make them better because you went through that thing. No one else can tell someone what it's like. Hear me now. Hear me. Hear me. No one else can tell someone how to not have an abortion. A good person who's probably had it. And the hurt that it caused. Amen. Now, I'm not saying go have an abortion so you can be a better counselor. Right. But I'm saying don't let the fact that you may have had one destroy you. Let God use it to your glory. Amen. To his glory. Amen. 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 There are people who come through drug situations where that thing almost destroyed them. Don't let the drug thing destroy you. Use it and say, you know what? This is who I was. And let me tell you how God delivered me from. So that I can teach you, counsel you, warn you of the dangers that you were to admonish. That's what it means to admonish you. Right? So that I can help you do this thing. So that you can do better than what I did. Amen. Instead of allowing it to say, this thing just tears me down. It is the very thing that has torn me up. It has destroyed my life. I have made this mistake and I can't overcome it. And I am not usable of God. You don't know the God we serve. Amen. Amen. He takes the very thing that, was, that could be your nemesis. And use it to his glory. Thank you. You could praise God that we praise God that He allows us to make mistakes and then uses us through the mistake. Mm -hmm. That's how we do some of the things that we do. 
We don't need to be professional psychologists or analysts, but what, what we ought to be as Christian families is that God has given us a book so that we can provide biblical, spiritual counsel to one another. That's called admonishing one another. That's what we're to do. We're to provide instruction. We're to provide exhortation. Even warning, depending upon the situation, to the need so that we can take people who are hurting and help direct their lives. Don't let the enemy win because you've made mistakes in life. Don't let him destroy you because you've done some things before that you're not necessarily proud of. Don't worry about that. Let God use it to his glory. Amen. A good biblical example that Paul gives us is what he said to Timothy. Look at what he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verse 16. And many of you know this verse. He says that, and here's the reason in 2 Timothy 3.16 that you and I have the scripture. It's the reason God gave us the Bible. I'm telling you, you need to have instruction. You need to have a book. You need to have something to go by to help you counsel people, to help you admonish people. He said this, all scripture is given, first of all, by inspiration of God. So that removes man from it. So you ain't got to worry about that book that was written. He said it was given by inspiration. God inspired the writers to write what they wrote. And... Here it is. He said it is profitable. You can profit from it. But what is it profitable for? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When God gave us the inspired word, he was given for a reason. Let's look at the first one. The first one he says is doctrine. You know what doc doctrine is? Doctrine is God's definition to teach you what is right. God gave you a book and gave you doctrinal teaching, because that's admonishing, to show you what is right. But he didn't stop there. Look at the goodness of God. It has been, he says, profitable for reproof. You know what? Reproof contrasts doctrine in this this. And this is the part of the Bible that people don't like. It tells you what's wrong. You know what? When I, there are people that, that this is what they'll do to the Bible. The Bible will make a statement about their lifestyle. And instead of them accepting the book, this is what they do. They attack the book. They say it was written by man. And then they, then they bring up all the Old Testament stuff and say, well, if that's the case, then we would, would, would uh, stone people to death because they don't know how to rightly divide the word of truth, right? Put the application where it belongs, right? And instead of realizing this, God gave us a book, and what he did was, is that book reproves you. That book will tell you, if you want to know what you're doing wrong, go to the book. You want to know if your lifestyle is wrong? Go to the book. I tell people all that they say, well, what do you think of this? I say, you know what? It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the book says. I don't have to, it, it removes Ray Stewart's opinion from it. Who cares what Ray Stewart thinks? What thus saith the Lord? What is God's opinion on it? You know what? God's book tells you what's right, but it don't get mad because it told you what's wrong. <clears throat> and you know what? That's what we're to do in reproving people. You can't just only tell people, oh, God is, is oh, it's, it's, so, uh, it's so good. I was driving in this morning, so I couldn't hardly listen. I don't necessarily listen to the radio anyway, right? But I just turned on the radio, and this morning it was dealing with uh, the, every channel had a, 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 a tribute to Prince. I mean, Prince is taking over the airwaves. Right? The people that didn't even listen to Prince listen to Prince. But I turned on Joel Osteen, and I am not your biggest Joel Osteen fan. But, but, but you know what? If God can get glory out of a rock, he can get glory out of Joel Osteen. Hey, amen. 
Amen? Amen. Yeah. Right? God can't get up. And he said some very profound things this morning. He just spoke to my heart this morning. I said, go ahead, Joel. Right? You know, but Joel, Joel is a guy, as I'm listening to him, he says things that are, you have to hear, hear listen to him for this reason. If you're down, listen to him. He'll lift you up, man. He'll lift you up. Everything he says is so positive. And this is so good. But you know what? Let me tell you something. The part of the book that people don't like is the part that reproves you. you I can't just tell my kids that they're good all the time. Sometimes I got to let them know that you're, what you're doing is wrong. That's where he, there's a little bit of a disconnect with him. Because you're not going to get 30,000 people if you tell them what's wrong. But that's what the Bible is profitable for. To tell you what's wrong. But then he gives the next one. Not only does he tell you what's right, not only does he tell you what's wrong, then he tells you, he corrects you. He tells you how to fix it. Because you know what? The Bible is given to tell you how to fix what you got going on wrong. Praise God that we have a book that not only tells us what's right from wrong, but it says, this is how to fix him. But then it's the last one, which is instruction in righteousness. You know what it done does? It tells us how to keep it fixed. I used to deal with a guy in NA, and he used to say, you know, my problem never was that I could, that, 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 that I didn't know that I needed to stop drinking. He said, my problem is I didn't know how to stay stopped. He said, I stopped every time I threw up. <laughs> every time I ran out, I stopped. My well, problem is that I didn't know how to stay stopped. You know what the Bible does? The Bible teaches you how to stay stopped. If you're doing it, the Bible is the instruction to tell you how to keep your life together. We call it maintenance. I don't care if you got a car. Every now and then, ladies, hear me. Every now and then, check the oil in the car. <laughs> Every now and then, you gotta rotate the tires, right? Every now and then, you need to tune it off. You know what the Bible is? It's, it's the instruction manual, right? Right? When we say basic instruction before leaving Earth, right? That's B I B L E, right? That's what it is for us. God has given us instruction on on on. What's wrong? What's right? What's wrong? Right? How to fix it? Right? And then how to keep it fixed? How do, how do I maintain this life? How do I live for Christ? I, so, all right, I stopped doing what I was doing, but how do I stop doing it tomorrow? That's what the scripture is for. Why is it all done? He says this in the next verse, in verse 17. Here's the purpose that God does it. He says that the man of God might be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good work. After he goes through this process of, of telling you what's wrong and how to fix it and how to keep it fixed, what he what the Bible is trying to do is this. You, the Bible says that we're a building. Right? We're God's building, it calls us. Right? So in order for there to be a proper building, the building needs to have furnishings in it. You know what the Bible gives you? All of the couch, the chair, the, the tape, all of the things to make the house full. He doesn't want you to be an empty house. He wants you to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's why we have the instruction of the Word of God to bring us to the place that we receive everything that God wants us to have. When you understand doctrine, when you know right from wrong biblically, when you learn how to fix what is right from wrong, and then you have a consistent study of the, of the Word of God to know how to keep what was wrong fixed as God's temple, as God's building, you put into yourself the furnishings that God has provided to make you, watch this, he says, a perfect man. Perfect in the Bible doesn't mean sinlessly perfect. It means thoroughly furnished. It means that you have in you all of the things. So that's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know what you are then? You're a perfect man. You know what makes you a perfect man? You have Christ in you, who is the perfect one. Because you have prepared yourself. Let me tell you something. 
You know, I, I'll be brief. Because this stuff is on my heart all the time. Right now, you know what God is doing? If you allow me. God is preparing you or giving you the opportunity to be prepared so that he can come back one day and receive it. It's the picture of the, the wedding, right? Right? The bride doesn't see the husband until the time for the wedding. So she goes off into some place and she's covered by this veil. The veil is the cloud. God is going to split the veil and he's going to receive his bride. The day is coming that he's going to lift the veil from you and he's going to receive you. Here's what you better be doing though. You better be preparing yourself to meet your husband, man. Because don't know me. One of me have this bride that when she comes to the room, she wasn't ready. Can you imagine? She, all of a sudden she take her leg off. <laughs> Right? Our lashes come off, the wig come off, man. You know what I'm saying? Come on. But but you know what? And don't take that personal. You know what? Because <laughs> I'm not trying to, I didn't mean it personal, but right? I'm just trying to make a point. So here's the point. Right? Prepare yourself as a chaste virgin being prepared to receive the Lord. He is waiting to receive you. He's coming back for you. You want to make sure that you prepare. Use your time wisely. You only got a few minutes left on this earth. Prince went into Paisley Park, and I'm sure he didn't prepare to die. And you know what? His time was up. Be prepared to meet your maker. What are you doing with your time? How are you spending your time? How are you being prepared? What are you doing to prepare yourself to be received of the Lord? So that you come before him and he's able to say, well done, now good and faithful servant. Look at you. Man, you know what? My husband, he stands up here and I stand up here with him and I get to stand next to him. And here, da, da, da. He comes up right. And I just normally, I just make sure that I take a look over at him. Most of the time they like this. <laughs> They're waiting. Boy, 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 here she comes. Waiting to receive his bride. He's there. He's going, oh, heart's not there. Well, you know what? It's not uncommon that he'll start crying. All of a sudden, I see a tear rolling there. And she's just beautiful. She's white dress, father's like. <laughs> you know? That's what you want to be. You want to be somebody that when the Lord comes, he's just looking to receive you. You know why? Because you have a moment in history where you can prepare yourself for him, where you can get everything that you have for him, so that when he comes, he puts at you and says, oh my gosh, look at this Christian. Look at them come. Look at them walking down the aisle. Here comes my bride. <laughs> That's what we want to be. That's what you got time for. That's what history is all about for you. That's what you should be doing. Don't get so consumed with your job that, that, that when the Lord comes, you got bags under your eyes because you gave everything you had to your boss. You didn't even have time for him. You gave everything you had to your boss. You have your Bibles. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, we'll look at this because here's the reality. Our believers biblically need the, 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 to, to be corrected or to be guided or to be admonished in order to prevent you going in the wrong direction. And what we do is admonish people. Hear me. The reason that you admonish people is because you are part of the preparation process that God is using to prepare them to present them to himself. God is using you in this preparation process, right? And sometimes what we're to do is guide them away from choices that are sinful. But other times, it, this is what we admonish people for. This is why I preach, to teach you how to live in obedience. I want to 
show you how to live in obedience to the Lord. And the reason is because you're going to stand before the husband at the wedding. Look at what it says in Colossians chapter 1 in verse 28. It says this. He says, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom why that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You know what? You know what? I guarantee you, when the Lord comes, I'm going to be standing there. I know I'm getting raptured. I, listen, I know I'm going. Amen. The scripture gives me the confidence that I can know that I'm saved. You know, what I'm, you know what, what I get to do? You know what I'm trying to do every time I preach to you? I want you to stand before him perfect. I want you to stand before him. I want to stand there. And they say, and he says, all right, grace and truth, line up. Hey. <laughs> Here we go. I know what was invested in you. I know how much time was invested in the teaching and preaching. I know how much we gave. Let's see what you did with it. Let our cred prayer. Come up here. Steve Langham, come up here. Bella McClain, come up. Be like, what's that TV show? Come on, man. <laughs> the price is right. When the price is right, they call their name, they jump off, and everybody around them starts screaming. <laughs> right? And you say, Come on down. They run down the aisle, jump up down. Will you do that before the Lord? Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you'll be able to stand before Him, jumping up and down, and saying, I know I did what I was supposed to do. Right. So I'm not worried about this. Right. Hmm. President accounted for. Or will you hear me? Or will you stand before him and you're naked in the shame because you had all the time to do it and you spent more time, you spent more time on you than you did on him? You know what, you, you know what Solomon's biggest problem was? He took more time building his own house than he did the house of the Lord. Some of our yards are pristine. Some of our yards look so big as that we have to. And the, and, and, and the mulch looks good. The flowers are all laid out. We have little flowers, little welcome mats in front of the door and everything. And God's house looks like it's shame. Wouldn't that be a tragedy? You know what I'm trying to do? In March, I'm not trying to get on you. I'm only trying to encourage you and move you. You're going to stand before the Lord. You need to be ready. Okay, I'm not up here trying to get you shouting and jumping up and down and screaming and running up and down the aisles. I'd rather you walk out of here and say, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself when you walk out the door, where do I stand in this? Okay, if I go before the Lord tonight, if tonight is my Paisley Park moment, how am I going to stand before you? Am I going to be naked and ashamed when all my brothers and sisters in Christ are going to be looking at me? All of, the, all of the saints of God from history, throughout history, all of them are going to be there. All of the children that were beheaded, all of the men who sacrificed their lives, all of the families who gave everything up for the cross of Christ are going to be standing there. And you're going to come before them. All of the people that gave up everything they had for, for, so that God would be glorified are going to be standing there. How are you going to stand next to them? Hallelujah. 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 How are you going to look? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right? How you, that, you know what? This is admonishing you. I'm not trying to keep make you, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to warn you. And you know what? We should be admonishing one another. 
That's what we're called to do. Look, he goes on. Now, let's look at this. Finish this verse up. He says this. He says this. First of all, it will be, he said that we're to be, how do we admonish one another, right? How do we do it? This, before you can admonish someone, one, look at what it says here in point A. It says that we should be full of goodness. Look back at Romans 15, verse 14. He says this, And I myself am persuaded of you, my brethren. He says that ye also are full of goodness. In order to admonish someone effectively, you need to be full of goodness. Before you can counsel other people, we ourselves need to have, watch this, an upright lifestyle. I'm not saying that you got it all together. We're to be godly, learning how to please the Lord, and aligning ourselves under Him so that we can help other people do the same thing. People need help. They really do. You know what? Craig called me the other day, and I love Craig. Craig's my brother. He, I guess, there he can come along. Craig called me the other day, and I had to get off the phone with Craig. Because Craig said something to me that had me in tears. He knew, he knew that I was crying. You know, sometimes you just had, I had to get off the phone. I couldn't talk to him no more because I was full of tears. And it doesn't matter what it is that he said. But when he said it, it just struck me. And I could only weep because of our conversation. You know what Craig was doing? He admonished me. He wasn't getting on me. He wasn't, he, he, what he was doing was helping me to understand more perfectly this, why we have this ministry. Because sometimes I need someone to, to keep me reminded of why we do this. I do. And he admonished me. You know how he was able to do that? In Craig, the scripture says there's no good there. Amen. But, in order for him to admonish me, he needed to be full of goodness. You know who the scripture said? Jesus said, why call ye me good? Right? Because he's the only good thing that we have. And you know what? We're to be in the book so we can be full of goodness, Christ. And the counsel that he gave me was not his words. He, he quoted scripture. So that we are full of goodness. We need to admonish it. You, you cannot leave this church on Sunday have absolutely no relationship with anyone in this church. And, 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 and be full of goodness. Here's the reality. The goodness in you is what will cause you to be in the lives of other people. What I do is not because I desire always to do it. Even though I desire to pastor a church and I desire to be in the lives of people, I, I do it, first of all, because I don't forget what God did in my life. I don't forget how I am saved. I don't forget how I came through the door. But you know what the biggest difference in me is? I have a person that lives in me that motivates me. He is called the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm not judging people. But you can't help sometimes to ask yourself, do you really think they're saved? There's never, they, they, if, if you never have any compassion, it ain't you. It's the Holy Spirit in you. It's because you're full of goodness. Right? That's what motivates you to do what you do. If you, if you never, ever, you know, look out for other people and care about the lives of other people, it ain't you that does it. It's the Holy Spirit. You can only ask yourself, are, are they full of goodness? That is what causes you to admonish one another. Because you're full of goodness. The goodness is the Holy Spirit of God through the person. Through, through, it's the Lord Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit. That's the goodness that you need to be full of. Being full of goodness means that you're Christ-like. Because according to the scriptures, none of us are good. Only Christ. It says this in Psalm 27, verse 13. It says, he said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
says this in Psalms 31, 19. He says, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Says this in Psalms 33, verses 3 through 5. He says, Sing unto the Lord a new song, play skillful with loud no with a loud noise, for the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. But here's the second thing to do to be. He said we need to be secondly filled with all knowledge. He says, and I myself in Romans 15, 14. Also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, but then he says that you'll be filled with all knowledge. I'm going to challenge you here. So just hang on. I'm only admonishing you. So don't take it personal. Craig, did we cut the air off? Cut the fan off, bro. Everybody else hot, isn't it? Come on, man. <laughs> I'm up here working. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to take a shower as soon as I get home. I can't wait to get home and take a shower. You know what? That's why I get in the book. Because sometimes you can't wait to get clean. You've been dirty. You've been so dirty that you just, you know, you work in landscape. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, dirty, gritty. That's what we ought to feel spiritually. That you wake up in the morning and say, I need to get clean before I go outside. Amen. Amen. I'm stinking. Get in the book. Amen. So you can be so you can receive the washing of water by the word of God. Amen. Amen. In order to admonish others effectively, you first of all need to be full of goodness, but secondly filled with all knowledge. While being full of goodness involves your personal lifestyle as you are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, being filled with all knowledge is dealt with the information that you receive. Hear me. Don't take this personally. I'm only trying to admonish you. If you don't consistently show up at, at Bible study, some of you cannot. But if you're not, you know what you, you're doing then? You know, this is what I'm left to, to believe that you're doing. That you are at home just bathing in the scripture <coughs> on your own. So that you can be filled with all knowledge. That's what I have to depict on. So God said, okay, Ray, make it easy. Have a little midweek service. And what you do is you give them, you go ahead and wash them for, until they're able to wash themselves. Right? You know how you have kids, at first you, you wash them. And then hopefully you, they learn how to wash themselves. You know what we're doing here? We're trying to help wash you. So that you can be filled with all knowledge. The only knowledge you need to be filled with is this book. You know what? So, if, so this is what's going to happen. Either you're, because you're not here, you're either filling yourself with all knowledge, or you're letting empire and scandal fill you with all knowledge. <laughs> That's what happens. You're letting, you're letting Ellen fill you with all knowledge. Oh, we're in the pool. We're, we, we get, you're, here's the thing about an empty thing. It's going to be filled one way or another. Amen. It's like an empty field, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, you guys are dealing with this in landscaping, right? Right? Fields are full of weeds, aren't they? You know why? Because an empty field is going to fill itself, even if it fills itself with weeds. You know what some of us are full of? You're full of weeds. I was getting ready to say something. <laughs> you, all I'm saying is this. Before you can admonish someone, you've got to receive instruction in order to admonish them correctly. You need to be filled with all knowledge because if you're not, you're giving them your knowledge. You're giving them your opinion. You're giving them some other opinion. You're not giving them the opinion that comes from the scripture. And if you're not at home and you're not, you don't have a personal relationship with the word of God, do this. You got to use your time wisely. Don't come. Don't come. Don't. All I'm trying to do is admonish you. If Wednesday's gonna come and go. If you, if you, I want you, and I want you to think about me on Wednesday night. How about we go back to last Wednesday? What was you doing last Wednesday night that you couldn't be? 
Don't answer me. Was you in the book on your own? Ah, damn it. It's up to you. But you better be filled with all knowledge or you're never going to win anybody to Christ. You're never going to admonish anybody. You're never going to give them the scriptures. You're never going to counsel them. You're never going to warn them. You're never going to be filled with all goodness. You're never going to do the things that you're going to stand accountable for. You know why? Because you are too busy. It's up to you. When the Lord Jesus Christ died, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to give you this and we're done. This is the last verse I've got. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Let me tell you why we admonish you. This is what it says. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10 says this. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. Why? That he might fill all things. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And this is what God did. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did he give them? He gave them for the perfecting of the saint, for the work of the ministry, verse 12, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why did he do that? He did it till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, watch this, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you realize that's why, Christ, why, why he gave pastors and, and hit prophets and, 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 and apostles and pastors and teachers and evangelists? you realize that he did that? Because he's trying to bring you to be a perfect man to you to the stature of the fullness. You know what he's talking about when he talks about the fullness of the stature of Christ? He's talking about growing you up. He said the reason that he gave these people in the church it's so that you would grow up and become mature Christians. You know what our problem is? We're too busy. It's the purpose of the church. You know my job is to help grow you up? It is. You know why? Because I want you to be full of goodness and filled with all knowledge. So I'm trying to give you. You know what? You know why? Because I want to make sure that I stand before the Lord. <laughs> having done everything that I was called to do. I'm worried about it. I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about my, my standing before the Lord. I'm not worried about it. I just want, you know what? I have to win. You know, I do. What is it? Pride, little pride, maybe. In the earth, right? Some pride do. I don't want to stand before Him and, and be all ashamed. Because I didn't do, I don't want that. I think about that all the time. That's my motivation. So you know what I'm doing? I'm trying to get, I want you to be there with me. I want all of us to stand there together and we all did what we did. No, we're all good. I'm going, God, God, what you gave me, I was good with. And here's the proof of it. Here's Bill. Right? Here's Kathy and the Here's Here's John. Here's all, you know, here's all the people. Lord, this is what I did. I invested in their life. The best way that I knew how. Now, when you come up, this is what you want to be able to do. Lord, all that he gave me, I invested in the good. Now here's all the people that I impacted. Here's all the people whose lives I invested in. Here's all the children that we fed. Here's all the souls that we saved. Here's all the people that when you gave, we, we took full advantage of what you gave made available to us. And Lord, here, this is what I did. Or did I take my talent and bury it in a hole? What did you do with it? What did you do with what God gave you when he saved you? How are you doing? If you got to give an account for it tomorrow, what's your accountability? What do you think, Prince? If Prince was saying, you know what? He stands before the Lord. What do you think the Lord is going to say about Prince? Oh, Prince, you gave the best concerts in the world. Oh, my gosh, you sold out all the concert halls. People were just so enough. You can do the splits and all that. <laughs> right? 
You know what, Prince? You was making it rain. Huh? <laughs> you think he's gonna stand before the Lord accountable for that and God's gonna give a who? You know what he's gonna say, Prince? Where's the souls? Where's the people? Who did you invest in? How many lives did you impact? Michael Jackson? How many lives did you impact? Where's the people? Because you know what? What you did on this earth don't count for a hell beans if you didn't do it to the glory of God. <coughs> Who cares what you did? Amen. Who cares how many mansions you own? How many, who cares how many Rolls Royces you rode around? Now look at them. They're a heap of trash. Mm -hmm. Where's the souls that you invested in? I'm telling you guys, we're going to stand accountable. Here's my admonishment to you. You better think about what you're going to do here. I'm warning you. The day is coming, it's fast approaching. You're going to stand before God. And I'm telling you now, you better make sure you stand before him. You want to stand accountable having done all that you could to live for him because you only got so many years on this earth to do. What are you doing with it? I'm warning you. I'm warning you. I'm telling you, I can't give you a bigger warning. You go and you have your nice little Sunday afternoon dinners. There's people hungry. What are you doing with your resources? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for the admonishment that you've given us according to the scriptures, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would help me to preach what I'm supposed to, Lord.